Good morning and welcome to LLT 121, Classical Mythology. When last we left our heroes, the Homeric heroes, the heroes of the Trojan War, which was really fought right around 1200 BC, I was discussing the concept of Nostos, or return trip home. I was being hassled, I was being taxed, I was being brutalized emotionally and intellectually by somebody who took exception to my remark that nobody actually won the Trojan War. Nobody did. Oh yeah, the Greeks got to sack the city all right, there's no denying that. But look what happened to the Greeks when they went home. Let's take Agamemnon. For example, what happened to him? He got killed by who? That's pretty bad. And what happened to his wife? She got killed by their son. But that was all right because he, he'd killed her. Nope, he's no winner. Menelaus, Mr. Helen. That's what I call him on the test. Um... He actually did get to get back together with Helen. He took Helen back, they got on a ship, and they were going to sail back to ancient Greece, but they were blown away by a, by a storm and wound up living for seven years in ancient Egypt. I say ancient Egypt because even to the ancient Greeks, ancient Egypt was very, very ancient. Nestor made it home in one piece, too. Does anybody have any guess as to why Nestor made it home in one piece? Okay, go on, build on that thought, Jeremy. Well, yes and no. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> go back home. Um, that ain't bad. It isn't right either. Because I think, in his heart of hearts, Homer empathized with the old guy who talks just about forever. And if any of you have ever written fiction, as I have, I've written some very bad fiction, in which the hero of whatever short story always tends to be this um, middle-aged college professor with a slightly balding hairline. Um, everybody respects him, everybody worships him, he publishes a book every month. <clears throat> Get real. Okay, but Nestor does. He, honest to God, does make it home. Ajax the Greater. I've decided that the um, soundtrack for today's class will be done by the Crash Test Dummies. You remember them? This really lugubrious band who mumbled everything. Ajax the Greater, what happened to him, Farallon? He killed himself. You want to hear a good one? Well, this is really a bad one. Um, Ajax the Lesser, the little girly man who fought with the bow and arrow, here's what he did. He violated Cassandra. Okay in a temple of Athena. This is a most bad career move because it gets Athena on his case. Athena, you will recall, is a good friend of her uncle Poseidon, the influential sea god. And as Ajax the Lesser is sailing home, actually he's pointing towards Greece, I want somebody at the end of this little thing to raise their hand and tell me what it read on his death certificate. The weather started getting rough, the tiny ship was tossed, Ajax was washed up on the shore of an uncharted desert island, and he said, not even the gods could destroy me, I'm Ajax the lesser, darn it. Greer, what did it say on his death certificate? Hubris. Poseidon blasts the rock with his trident. And that's the last we see of Ajax the Lesser. Nobody seems to miss him very much. Pause for a question here. Uh, because he killed a bunch of sheep, because he lost the 
um, debate contest for the sword and shield, blah, 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 blah. Neoptolemus, son of Achilles, the ten-year-old wunderkind of Vor, otherwise known as Priam. Yeah, Priam's killer. He did something pretty smart. He took the land route home. <laughs> that was smart. But he made the bad career move of marrying Hermione, who is the daughter of Menelaus and Helen. Now I know what you're going to say. Since when is it a bad career move to marry the daughter of Helen of Troy? I mean, she's probably a pretty hot looking babe, right? Oh yeah, but she was already betrothed. She was already engaged. She was already engaged to Orestes. What does Orestes do when he's mad? Yeah, he killed his mom. And if you marry his fiance, guess what he's going to do to you? And say, Neoptolemus, Ugh! that's the end of Neoptolemus, the 10 year old wunderkind of Vor. As a um, famous scholar with a slightly receding hairline has observed, legend. Legend, by its very nature, contains legend by its very nature. Come on. Legend by its very nature contains a kernel of historical fact. And this particular kernel effect is, while the cat's away, the mice will play. We've already seen it in the Agamemnon story. He's been gone for 10 years. Clytemnestra has been running the place quite well in his absence. Thank you very much. Shut up. Um, and maybe she doesn't want to have Agamemnon come back and say, I'm king again. The next category of heroes... Okay, here's the Rorschach map of the Mediterranean. Ooh, it's really looking pretty scruffy today. But I don't care because the semester's almost over. And here's the edge of the world. Here's hell. <laughs> Belong to a separate category. Let's start out with Diomedes, the fellow who wounded, who wounded Aphrodite and Ares in book five. He returns to his hometown of Argos only to find that his wife has been untrue to him. You know, and that happens. That one person is away for a long period of time, may not even come back and finds out that his or her main squeeze of love has been kind of getting some on the side. And so Diomedes wanders around the Mediterranean, finally winds up in Italy, founds a number of cities, and is worshipped as a god after his death. Wanders around the Mediterranean, finally winds up in Italy, where he founds a number of cities, and is worshipped as a god after his death. Idomeneus, the hero of Crete, the doctor who specializes in dealing out gory wounds. There's a couple of stories about what happens to him. Version of the story number one is very boring. He comes home. He finds out his wife has been untrue. So he kills her, thereby incurring miasma. That's the boring version. I mean, you've seen that one before. You might say somebody just like me did up to get him out of town. Here's version number two, which has kind of a kind of a Hebrew tinge to it. You'll remember from a famous song that God once said to Abraham, kill me a son. Abe said, God, you must be putting me on. Idomeneus was at sea. The weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed, and Idomeneus vowed to Poseidon 
Poseidon, if you just let me ride in the storm out. I will sacrifice to you, Poseidon, the first creature that comes to greet me once I land on my home island of Crete. Okay, you with me? And here's what happens. The weather stopped getting rough. The tiny ship stopped being tossed. Idomeneus sails into the port of Crete like, you know, he was ice skating on glass. And the first person who comes to greet him is his son, Idomeneus Jr. Dad! Bringing up an interesting dilemma. Dilemma being a name for where you want a situation where you have only two choices. There are two paths you can go by, and in the long run, they both suck. One, kill your son. Two, hack off Poseidon. What does he do? Yes, he does. And unlike the biblical parallel, Yahweh does not appear to say, I was only joking. The son dies. Idomeneus incurs miasma. And so, he wanders around the Mediterranean finally winds up in Italy, where he founds a few cities and is worshipped as a god after his death. Pardon? Shh. There's more. <laughs> Wanders around the Mediterranean, finally winds up in Italy, where he founds a few cities and is worshipped as a god after his death. Important cities. Wonderful cities. Beautiful cities. Philoctetes likewise limps into a real bummer of a situation. He likewise comes home to his award-winning hometown in Thessaly, and he's driven out, whether because they didn't want him anymore, because his foot still stank, or what have you. Guess what Philoctetes winds up doing? Wanders around the Mediterranean. What else? What happens next? Finally, don't be hateful, finally winds up in Italy, where he and and shut up, and is worshipped as a god after he dies. He was the guy with the bow of Hercules, he was the steersman, and another Trojan hero, Trojan War hero, who was from Troy, actually. We're not going to be able to talk much about him right now. His name is Aeneas. He's the son of um, Aphrodite and that promising young shepherd and Kaisis. He, too, well, he doesn't have a home to go to. It's been turned into a parking lot. But all the same, he wanders around the Mediterranean, finally winds up in Italy, founds a few cities, and is worshipped as a god after he dies. Let's repeat the drill together, and then I'll take a question. Diomedes, Idomeneus, and Philoctetes all wander. Ah, you skipped. They wander around the Mediterranean, finally wind up in Italy. Okay, see? Now just remember this. Do this a few times, and it's going to be worth 15 to 20 points on your exam, maybe. I'm trying to help you. This is an experiment in classical Greek learning. Let's say it one more time. Wandered around the Mediterranean. Okay, there may be hope for you people. I make a joke out of it. But have you ever watched modern sitcoms? how repetitive the plots are. Let's take a bunch of girls and a bunch of guys. They're all in their early 20s. You know, they're all wrestling with their personalities, you know, and their place in the world. And let's follow their wacky hijinks. How many shows like that are on their TV? Let us not tax the ancient Greeks for the apparent cookie-cutter versions of their trip home stories, all right? Yeah, I know, I, I could just conk out just thinking about Son of Return to the Valley of Friends. Gag me. There is one Nostos story, though, that is so great. It's about a guy 
who wanders around the Mediterranean. <laughs> and he just wants to get home. He wants to get home to his wife. Huh? No. It's a story of a guy named Odysseus. A lying sack of poop. Who wandered the Mediterranean for ten years after the Trojan War and was faithful to his wife the entire time. Now, before I start telling you or going into the story of Odysseus with you, it occurs to me that I forgot something I had meant to explain to you, how history, by, how legend by its very nature, contains a kernel of historical fact. It is a well-known fact that ancient Greece, okay, as is modern Greece, is a rocky place where one's seed can find no purchase. That is to say, it's not good for growing much of anything. The soil is not very good. It's not very deep. You don't have to dig too far before you get to bedrock. And if you don't know anything about crop rotation, excessive fertilization, you're going to burn up that soil just like that. But meanwhile, the babies keep coming. So what do you do? You colonize. You send out groups of people, and this is something, obviously, that European countries did too, in the quote-unquote age of discovery, when after Columbus quote-unquote discovered America, to the great joy of the people who had already been there for centuries, the Greeks did send out colonies, whoops, let's draw Asia Minor in here real quick, to various islands, to Italy, even as far as southern France, Anywhere they figured the boat would come in, they would, it would work like this. We, the natives of Springfield, decide that there are too many Springfieldians for us to support. I know, let's round up all these men and women, put them in a boat, and send them to found New Springfield somewhere. Not only is it a good way of reducing population that your land can't support, it's a good way of increasing your city's influence. The citizens of quote-unquote New Springfield, okay, you all people, you build your city, you found your own city, you are sovereign in your own right, but you do have ties with your mother city of Springfield. A great deal of Sicily and Italy was settled in this fashion beginning roughly 900 B.C. A great deal of southern France, or at least the Riviera, was settled in this way. A great deal of Asia Minor was settled in this way. Greek cities sending boatloads of folks to found new cities because the Greek soil couldn't support them anymore. And that, folks, is the kernel of historical fact. Philoctetes is said to have found a city called in ancient Greek, Neapolis, New City. Woo-hoo. They, they founded so many of them, they ran out of names. Nea, Neapolis became... Let's see, how... Oh, oh crap, it became... It's now known as Napoli in Italian. We know it as Naples. Want to know a famous city Philoctetes founded? He founded Naples. Maybe he didn't found Naples. Naples was probably founded by a bunch of schmucks from the awards-winning city in Thessaly. The point being that the people of this new town, new city, wanted to have a famous hero as their founder, wanted to be able to say, we weren't founded by some bunch of schmucks from some little burg in Thessaly. I know, we were founded by Philoctetes! Nobody seemed to be in much of a rush to claim Philoctetes as their founder, so they took him. There. And now, Crystal. Did you say that um, Aeneas did the same thing? Yeah, more or less. But keep in mind that Aeneas is a Trojan, and what he's going to do is wander around and find, found Rome. The people of Rome had a bad history with the ancient Greeks. On the one hand, they derived a great deal of their culture from the ancient Greeks and admired the ancient Greeks' culture, but on the other hand, they ruled ancient Greece. They <laughs> conquered the ancient Greeks. <coughs> They didn't want to be founded by any stinking Greek. You know, the Greeks are just a bunch of 
woohoo boys who can't even rule their own country. They're just a bunch of cultured people who can't rule their own country. So the Greek, the Romans preferred the version of their story that said that they were founded by a Trojan named Aeneas. Okay. Good question. Well answered. I'm going to offer you a famous person's summary of the Odyssey. The story of the Odyssey is not long. Oh yeah? <laughs> you ever try to read it? You ever try to read it in Greek? The story of the Odyssey is not long. A man is away from home for many years. Poseidon is constantly on the watch to destroy him, and he is alone. At home, his property is being wasted by suitors, and his son is the victim of an intended plot. He reaches home tempest-tossed. He makes himself known, attacks his enemies, and destroys them, and is himself saved. This is the heart of the matter. The rest is episodes. In six lines of my lecture notes, this famous dead ancient Greek, Aristotle, sums up the plot of that 400-page bestseller, The Odyssey. The rest is episodes, says Aristotle. The rest is weird trips to far-out places, interesting character by play, and I have to admit, in The Odyssey, a lot of boring... <laughs> Get on with the point. I'm sorry. I like the first half of the Odyssey a whole lot better than the second half. When the Odyssey begins, we're in Ithaca. Ithaca is the home of King Odysseus. Ithaca is actually kind of like over here. Queen Penelope has been without benefit of her husband for some 19 years or so, even more. You know, the Trojan War ended nine years ago when Penelope has been tending the home fires, you know, for 19 years, and she's getting tired of it. To make more matters more annoying, there's all these suitors. These suitors, these people who are <laughs> wooing Penelope, these people, these guys, these manly men who, for some reason, were not manly enough to go off to war and get killed with Odysseus and the other guys. Okay, they may be in their, tw well, let's see, it's been 19 years. Maybe they're in their 20s. Pardon? No, 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 they weren't. They, 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 they pride themselves on their manliness. Okay, and they all want, they say, hey, Penny, um, you need a husband, you need loving. Odysseus is dead. Marry me. And Penelope, well, she doesn't want to get married to any of them. She still hopes that Odysseus is alive, but she's got a problem. Well, it's not really a problem. She's got a problem in that society. Can she kick them all out of the house and say, you're all a bunch of leeches, get the bleep out of my house? No, she can't say that because she's a girl. Never mind that Penelope is probably smarter than all of them put together. By her status as a woman in ancient Greek Homeric society, she just can't kick all their butts and say, get out, much as she would dearly love to. She has this one trick. It's kind of neat. She says, all right, I'll marry you, guy, one of you jokers. I'll pick one of you jokers out when I'm finished weaving this burial shroud for my father-in-law. Okay, say the suitors. Oh, sounds good, Penelope. Hurry up, Penelope. But of course, what Penelope does when after all the lordly suitors have, you know, drank them, drunk themselves blind and passed out, she unravels it. She manages to fool these geniuses for about three or four years before finally one of the slave women snitches on her. Penelope's been unraveling that thing every night. Oh, geez. Okay. A little, no gentlemen, you're not going to enjoy this. But in the entire Odyssey, the only two male characters with any brains at all are Zeus and Odysseus. Except for Odysseus, 
anybody with even a smidgen of intelligence in the whole poem is female. We're going to have a chance to see next time who's smarter, Odysseus or Penelope. As a matter of fact, the intelligence of women is so strongly pronounced, the fact that anybody with any brains in this poem is female, except for Odysseus and Zeus. Some people suggest it was written by a woman. Homer's daughter, maybe, even. Who knows? But when you read the Odyssey next time on your Christmas break, just think about it. Why is it that anybody with any brains is in this poem is female. Telemachus, take Telemachus for example. The son of Penelope and Odysseus. Sorry, he's about 17. And he's whining. He's, ah, they're, eating, they're bugging mom. They don't like me. Brother Grant, kill me. Where's my dad? You know, he's had it pretty rough. The last time he saw his dad, remember his dad was about to run over him with a plow 19 years ago. He probably has, you know, probably just traumatized him for life. Then all of a sudden, this old guy by the name of Mentor comes up to old Telemachus. M-E-N-T-O-R. You wonder where we get the term mentor? Here's where we get the term mentor. Mentor says... Well, actually, it's not mentor. Because mentor is about to say something intelligent. We'll say that the goddess Athena took over the body of mentor for a second. See, it had to have been a woman who wrote this. You know, because no mere male in the Odyssey could have said something so intelligent. Of course, could she say it to her, hey, I'm Athena? No, because Athena's a girl. Well, at any rate, Athena changes herself into the manly, wise man, Mentor, and he says, that is to say, Athena, Mentor says, put away your toys, you whining little turd. It's about time you grew up, went out and saw a little bit of the world. Don't be sitting here whining about your dad. Go out and look for him. Go visit Nestor. Maybe Nestor knows where he is and so on and so forth. And then Mentor turns into a bird and flies away, leaving Telemachus to think, that must have been a god. <laughs> and this god must have been, he's not really that dumb. Like all of you kids, you know, <laughs> except for Ray and Matt, Ray, Matt and I, and Regina, you know, we're a bunch of old farts. We know this is true, that... You have to spend a certain amount of your youth waning about how everybody is out to get you and how things aren't fair. Then you learn this is the way of the world, and you might as well learn to deal with it, and you're cool. Tele <laughs> Telemachus has to learn this, too. This is kind of funny. Telem Telemachus goes around asking, where's my dad? Where's my dad? It's true, the suitors are trying to kill Telemachus. But Telemachus gives him the slip. He's supposed to go... The suitors, you know, the suitors, if brains were dynamite, Mark, the suitors could not light a cigarette, okay? If brains were kerosene, Odysseus's sailors could not light a match. Face it, guys, we are all a pack of idiots in this award-winning poem. Telemachus starts to grow up, though. He's learning. He is learning, so help me. One thing he does is he goes to visit Nestor, but he runs into Nestor's son on the outskirts of Nestor's hometown of Pylos. This shows you that Telemachus is learning something. He runs into Nestor's son and says, I'd really like to go visit your dad, but I really don't have the time. Please give my warmest and most admiring regards to your heroic father. But I'd rather eat a quick dinner with you and go find out more about my dad. Erica, why is this such a good idea? Why is it such a good idea for Telemachus not to go into Nestor's palace to talk to Nestor, but to ask Nestor's son, I'd rather have dinner with you 
you know, we'll exchange presents and please give my regard. Pardon? So we'll talk. That's exactly right. But notice how gracefully he hands. He says, I'm not going to go in there and talk to your old man. I'm not going to get out till the end of the Aeneid if I do that. No, he says, he handles it with politeness, with consideration for other people's feelings. This boy's going to learn something yet. I sure hope so. I think so, as a matter of fact. One of the joys of reading Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, that I've not had that much time to go into is the character delineation, the ethos. And it is, Mark, a very charming exchange because you can tell in young Telemachus, you know, he's trying to look. You ever been pressed for a polite excuse not to go talk to somebody you, really, you don't dislike, but you don't want to go talk to him either? And he's scuffling, and I, I think Nestor's son understands completely. Yeah, I can, yeah, yeah, he's another one of those guys who doesn't want to talk to Dad. I could be a real turd to him, but he's a nice kid. I'll cut him some slack. You know, it's wonderful. It's a feast. You need to go read it. Um, only at the beginning of Book 5 do we find Odysseus. We haven't seen him yet. They've been talking about him all the time. But we only meet him in Book 5. He is on the island of Ogygia. Which is a very small island in the ocean, consisting of a palm tree, a cave, and a, all sorts of beach. In the cave is Calypso, a minor goddess who looks a lot like Winona Ryder. Okay? And over here is Odysseus, who has been trapped on this island for seven years as her love slave. She has even offered to make Odysseus immortal, saying, hey, Odysseus, I, Calypso, will make you immortal, if only you will agree to serve as my love slave throughout eternity. <coughs> there are worse things that could happen. But Odysseus says, no, I'm sorry. I am faithful to my wife. Oh, they've been doing it. They, 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 they get it on from time to time. He has to. But he thinks about his wife, Penelope. And he's crying and looking off towards Ithaca because he wants to be home with Penelope. Even though, you know, Penelope is 19 years older than she was last time, he saw her, you know, even though there's no guarantee that Penelope hasn't married one of these slime balls. There are no guarantees in life. But Odysseus, God bless him, God's bless him, still wants to go home to Penelope. But there are complications. Athena, goddess of war, wisdom, and women's work. Oh my God, look at that honker I drew on her. She'll kill me. Um, sees her old buddy Odysseus and says, Zeus, daddy, don't you think Odysseus has suffered enough? Okay. Athena is Zeus's fair-haired child. He gave birth to her himself. So he decides that it's time for Odysseus to go home. Yes. I'm getting there, Farallon. I mean, the, the annoying thing about it, you could, tell, you could start at any starting point in the Odyssey and tell it just, he hacked off Poseidon. So this wasn't first, then. this wasn't where he landed first. This is like all flashback. Okay. Say that again. This isn't where he landed first, this is all flashback. It's a flashback. You think that the flashback was something that was invented by a director who smoked close cigarettes out of a holder? and wore a scarf, you know, and a beret and all that junk. No. <coughs> Homer invented the flashback. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I like that. I mean, I could do that shtick, too. I give it a thumbs up. The, 
thing that Zeus does is he sends down Hermes, the messenger god, to announce to Calypso, Calypso, Odysseus doesn't want to stay. Calypso, it's time for Odysseus to go. Here's more proof supporting the thesis that only a woman could have written this. Because here's what happens. A real Homeric woman of this time period would say, Yes, sir, whatever Zeus does is fine with me. It's not what Calypso does. She rants and raves, and I dare say bitches at Hermes, saying, Oh, look, hey, this is great. Whenever you gods get a mortal woman that you like, hey, wahoo, you know, do what you want, but just let one of us goddesses get a hold of some mortal guy, and the whole world ends. we got to give it up. Demeter picked up a mortal boyfriend, and you turned him into a newt or something like that. She gets medieval on this, on Hermes, complaining about the double standard that gods can do whatever gods want to do with women. But if a goddess ever hits on a guy, it's very strange to find a viewpoint like that being expressed so vehemently in 750 BC. Well, let's not talk about angst bunch of losers um, and but Calypso realized that Zeus is the big cheese and the plot also demands that it happen so here Calypso says Odysseus Hermes says that I'm supposed to help you leave okay Hermes says that I'm supposed to help you leave so I'm going to help you build a boat and for about 500 excruciating lines Homer describes about how Odysseus took hold of the well-shafted ads and scraped the shri you know, there's even a simile for the shavings, and both parts and tools you never even knew existed. And I had to read this in ancient Greek. I was studying for my sight examination, so I had to take a three-hour sight examination in ancient Greek. This was one of the passages that could have been on it. One of my professors advised me, well, if that passage shows up, Joe, just assume that you'll, somebody hates you and you'll be taking the exam again. I mean, it's excruciating, especially when you know, as I know, what's going to happen to that ship. <coughs> what's going to happen to that ship? <laughs> yeah, the weather's going to start getting rough. Yes, exactly. He builds the raft. You know... You know, Calypso says, hey, one more time for old time's sake, Odysseus. Oh, what the heck, you've been a good girl. And then he gets on the boat. Odysseus is on this raft, sailing from the island of Ogygia, from... And then he runs into the influential sea god, Poseidon. Poseidon hates Odysseus. The weather starts getting rough. The tiny ship gets tossed. It gets smashed into all sorts of bits. And if not for the fact that he was hanging on to a log, and for the fact that Odysseus liked him, I mean, but for the fact that Athena liked him, the fact that he was the star of the whole poem, it was called the Odyssey after all, that is to say the plot demanded it, Odysseus would have been lost. He washes up on the shore of an uncharted desert isle. And in order to save chalk, <laughs> the island is named Scyria. It is the land of the Phaeacians. And Odysseus, he's buck naked. Okay, he's buck naked, he's scarfed up, you know, he's waterlogged, he's grody, he stinks, he's been having a bad day. And he stumbles up onto the beach where a couple of 15 year old girls, one of them, the princess Nausicaa, daughter of the king and queen, are doing laundry. 
couple of 15 year old girls doing their laundry out by the seashore. They finished their laundry and now they're just running around and playing. Woohoo, woohoo. How many people in this room have been a 15 year old girl at some point in their lives? Okay, who do I want to torment? Carrie, you're very quiet. Let's say you're a 15 year old girl, some big, huge, burly, naked guy comes running up out of the surf. What do you do? Help me out here. Kristen, what do you do? I don't want to hear. It depends on what he looks like. <laughs> you run, right? Screaming. You're not supposed to talk to strange men, and you're especially not to talk to strange naked men. Same goes for 15-year-old boys, okay? <laughs> Just run away. He comes running up to her. Odysseus keeps running up to this princess now, Sika, and says, help me. She says, okay, but first go stand behind a rock. I'm not really supposed to be looking at you. She's cool. She doesn't fling up her hands and go, ah, naked man, and go running into town. Maybe this poem was written by a woman. This kid has really got something on the ball. Odysseus starts saying, oh, fair lady, you are probably a goddess. Please show favor. Cut to the chase, bub. What would you like? Odysseus recognizes when he's dealing with somebody who's intelligent like him. Uh, some clothes? <laughs> Fortunately, she's been doing the laundry. She says, yes, here are some clothes that were for my brothers. I was washing them for my brothers, but here, put them on. Um, where do I go to get some help? You go into town where my dad, King Elsinus, and my mom, Queen Arete, rule the town. And Odysseus's next question is, can I like, like um, follow you in and stuff? Can you give me a ride? Now Sika looks at him and says, what are you, nuts? How do you think it would look that me, a 15, that I, a 15 year old princess, come into town with some naked man that I, half naked man that I picked up out on the beach? <laughs> no, you're going to have to find your way yourself. I mean, she knows when to be nice. And she knows when to say, uh-uh, I'm not putting my butt on the line for you. But she does give him a helpful piece of advice. She gives him the following helpful piece of advice. She says, walk in to the great, beautiful palace of my father, King Elsinus, and his wife, Queen Arete. Enter into the hall. Enter into the royal hall where my father sits upon the throne drinking his wine like a god. And walk right past my father and fall down at the knees of my mother, Queen Arete, and tell her your story. Because if she is kindly disposed to you, she can help you. She is a wise woman and men listen to her counsels. Whoa! My dad's sitting there drinking his wine like a god. Walk right by him. Talk to mom. And if mom likes you, it's done. Had to have been written by a woman. And Odysseus, in a sign of his intelligence, he's talking to a 15-year-old girl here. You know, he could say, <coughs> yeah, right. He listens to her. He listens to the 15-year-old girl and does what the 15-year-old girl tells him to do. You know, he's walking into the town. Athena, his buddy, right, shines grace on him, so he starts looking studlier, you know. He's looking like a human being again. He walks into the hall of King Elsinus, where King Elsinus sits there drinking his wine like a god, walks right by him, falls to his knees in front of Queen Arete, grabs her around the knees. That's how you did that when you were begging somebody back in those days and says, Queen Arete, your daughter told me um, that you could help me. I want to go home. But before he tells them where home is, they got to eat dinner, right? And so, because this is Homer, Homer can't tell you, oh, they sat around and had a really good dinner. 
No, Homer has got to tell you every single course that they ate in excruciating detail. Birds that nobody has ever figured out what kind of birds they were. You know, like roast emu on a spit or something. And there's entertainment, too. There's a bard playing his lawyer. He's blind and bald. And he's playing this really excellent tune about how... Um, about how Ares and Aphrodite got it on one time out on the sly. And they eat and drink, and at the end of the dinner, they say, Now, stranger, now that we've fed you, now that we've entertained you, please tell us who you are. And the stranger says, I am no ordinary stranger. I am Odysseus, king of Ithaca, and my fame reaches the skies. And here's where I've been since the Trojan War ended. And we go into major flashback. We're going to pick up with Odysseus and his wanderings in our next exciting episode of Classical Mythology. I'll see you then.